story and they interpret it in different mm -hmm. ways and I think life is about that it, life is about human beings and so uh, I want to put subjectivity into Wikipedia yeah. and we're doing that not just with teachers not just with professors not just with Nobel Prize winners but with young kids of six mm -hmm. seven ten years old and they all come with their own little ideas with this and perhaps they're a bit half-baked but that's great yeah. because they are now creating mm -hmm. because education is not just about um, teaching kids what is known but it's actually uh, uncapping their creative potential uh, as much as possible yeah. and that's what we're trying to do during his stay in Vietnam this time, Professor Croto, Chemistry Nobel Laureate, visited the Vietnam National University, where he gave a talk on education, the basis of peace, and the key to an enlightened global community. Let's take a closer look. Professor Croto's arrival marked the second time that Vietnam National University Hanoi had the honor to be visited by a Nobel Laureate since last December. Before giving his lecture, Professor Croto was presented the honorary doctorate by the university leaders. This was considered a milestone in the strategy to improve science education and development in the education sector. Hiện nay là chúng tôi đang chọn khoa hóa học để xây dựng cái khoa đầu tiên trong đại học quốc gia Hà Nội đạt chuẩn quốc tế. Thì rất may lần này thì chúng tôi được đón một cái nhà khoa học được giải thưởng Nobel về hóa học. Chúng tôi thấy rằng qua cái dịp này thì cái những cái hoài bão những cái đam mê khoa học của sinh viên khoa học của trường đại học khoa học tự nhiên đại học quốc gia hà nội sẽ được tăng lên rất nhiều. Instead of spending time to explain how his research won him a Nobel Prize, Professor Quoto told students stories of his life, his other passions such as graphic design and sport, and his experiences in choosing a career. He said that being passionate about the things you like can only lead to good results. That's one of the key pieces of advice Professor Croto gave to the Vietnamese students. Was for this design. I would have been quite happy not winning the Nobel Prize, okay? I was, I was very happy with my science before we made the discovery. I felt I was a success. I didn't go into science to win any prizes, let alone the Nobel Prize. And that's very important because I see here in Asia, how do you win a Nobel Prize? I don't know. I just do what I'm interested in. If it turns out something special comes, then maybe the Nobel Prize will come. Nguyen Khánh Hưng is among the chemistry faculties many students that listen to Professor Croto. Seeing a big name in chemistry in person sparked a passion for science among Hưng and his peers. Sinh viên mà học về ngành khoa học thì ai ai cũng có một một ít mơ ước về cái giải Nobel. Tất nhiên là nó rất là khó nhưng mà thứ nhất hôm nay được gặp cái người gọi là được đã từng đạt giải Nobel thì em đấy thấy em thấy thích thú thì em quyết định định là đến khi biết được là quá trình phấn đấu của ngài thì em càng thấy rằng là mình càng phải cố gắng hơn nữa và cũng như là một niềm sức mạnh để truyền cho em và cảm thấy được rằng là mình phải cố gắng hơn nữa để có thể biết đâu sau đấy là sẽ là sinh viên Việt Nam thì hoàn toàn có thể đạt một giải Nobel nào đó trong tương lai it could well be a long time before Professor Croto has another chance to meet Vietnamese students again, but his words will remain in the mind of these young people, acting as guidelines and driving force for their decisions in the future. So there it is. I'm only here to make you think. Thank you very much. In your lecture here in Vietnam, um, when you spoke at the National University, um, you spoke about education, the basis for peace, and the key to an enlightened global community. Yeah. So can you please brief us about the highlights of your presentation with some examples to illustrate? Um, well, the, the first thing is uh, education should be, as I say, first of all, teaching kids how they can decide what they're being told is true. The second thing is, and actually more important is to develop a humanitarian attitude to, mm -hmm. to the way things are so that if they become scientists they don't make more atomic bombs and landmines and things like this. Um, but from a teaching point they have to be creative and I think to be creative it, you have to have a wide uh, education not just in science. Whereas in the 50s and when we were using it we had to have rational 
uh, attitude to fixing things. Some um, car didn't work that well, so you had to work out. You have to have a scientific attitude to working out mm -hmm. what you fix. And so the dynamics of the technology now, I think, are counterproductive mm -hmm. as far as our young people are concerned. So that's a problem. And, and also the influences on them are not to do science and do things that are difficult and complicated. Yeah. They see, you know, supermodels making a huge amount of money and celebrities making this, that, the other. Mm -hmm. And so there's less incentive to work hard and mm -hmm. learn differential equations, which are not easy. So um, I point to those issues, yeah. or try to point to some of those thousands of issues uh, in my presentation. Mm -hmm. And after your first visit to the Vietnam National University, um, have you thought of any particular plans for cooperation or assistance? Yes, I mean, the, perhaps the most important reason for my travel is I, I try to get schools and universities to cooperate with me and participate in this global educational mm -hmm. outreach yeah. program for science, engineering and technology, which is GEOSET, so that we, they will contribute mm -hmm. and um, you, that uh, we'll get young people, particularly students in universities, to contribute their ideas and what they find fascinating mm -hmm. to this global cache of educational material. So what do you think is perhaps the biggest challenge facing many young scientists today? Well, I did talk about these. Uh, the first is to be a scientist at all, mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's not a real understanding of what it is. I think uh, some of them want to win Nobel Prizes, and they won't win them. They've got to do science because, first of all, they can make a good living at it, which is useful, uh, but also that they, they can play around with the way the universe is and be curious of where, where it is and work hard to find out how, how it works, why it works the way it does. Um, the second thing is actually quite difficult because I think the world today is so highly technological that young people, when they have a mobile phone or whatever, they can't find out how it works, whereas all the things that were around me when I was a kid, I could take them apart uh, and see how they work. I might not be able to put them back together again, but I can <laughs> see how it worked. I mean, I could take a clock to pieces and, oh, there's a spring, and I, yeah, I can see yeah. roughly how it worked. I couldn't put it back together again. <laughs> and so my world was full of things that I could um, repair. Mm -hmm. And you learn how things work by repairing them. You can't repair them now. You can't repair a camera. I mean, I had a camera, and I knew everything about that camera. And it, it works today as well as it work then if I had the film to put in it. And I could, I could probably make some film, right? Mm -hmm. But if my present camera goes, with all that electronics goes, um, then that's more or less it, mm -hmm. because it'll be more expensive to fix it than to buy the next and generation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably bad for the um, development of a scientific attitude. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be aware of that. But there are also other problems for kids today. I didn't, there were no people earning hundreds of thousands of pounds to play soccer. When I was uh, uh, sort of starting, soccer players in England got 20 pounds a week, right? Uh -huh. I could make t more than 20 pounds a week, I think doing science. <laughs> but I certainly can't make a hundred thousand pound a week uh, doing science, whereas some soccer players are being paid that yeah. and they're injured, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's not good. So we have this celebrity issue. So um, that, uh, you know, footballers are being paid these huge amounts of money and therefore that's a bad icon for young people, particularly 
the, the African-American community in the USA, where most of the uh, icons they have are uh, fo American footballers, basketball players, mm -hmm. and, and how many can, can be successful uh, professionally in this? Uh, not very many. And I look, look at um, Central Africa. Um, what are their icons? They're marathon runners. Well, how many are going to be able to earn a living yeah. as a marathon runner? So I think it's very important that in the developing world, we ha they start to have icons, scientific icons, and I think it's fantastic that you have a field medalist here in Vietnam to show mm -hmm. that um, you know intellectual hard work and uh, a passion to understand something in the math, mathematics and sciences no, I'll tell you. is, is mm -hmm. possible. But I'm sure he didn't do this to win a lot of money, mm -hmm. or even probably to win the Fields Medal, yeah. uh, because it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, nine out of 10 Nobel Prize winners, I am sure are totally s as surprised as I am that we won the Nobel Prize. There are one or two who tackle big problems, and I know them, and I just say, well, I don't tackle big <laughs> problems, they're too difficult for me. <laughs> and it turns out that, as I said before, the unexpected is where the big Surprise. During the reception held in your honor, Vietnamese Deputy Prime Minister Nguyen Thien Nhan said that Vietnam looks forward to your support in the future. Do you plan to return to Vietnam for any cooperation projects um, or to help Vietnamese scientists in some yes, way? Yes, I, I, I intend to return by internet at the very least <laughs> uh, because I now can't go everywhere. Yeah. <coughs> so um, I now give presentations via the internet, and I do this maybe uh, several times mm -hmm. a year to India. And I've done this now to Iceland, to Germany, to in Australia, to 2,000 kids, so I can mm -hmm. reach people that I can't go any other way. Um, but I, I'm hoping that um, it'd be a two-way thing, that uh, there will be creation of educational material in, uh, in Vietnamese mm -hmm. here yeah. and contributing to this uh, global initiative. Mm -hmm. In a developing country like Vietnam, how do you think we should invest in science, including chemistry? What strategies or approaches should Vietnam consider for the future? Well, not to think about uh, com competition, but uh, to create a, an environment in your universities where young people, young scientists can do what they want to do rather than what people in authority think they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be creative doing something yeah. you're not passionate about. And if you look at um, the, the big breakthrough, almost all the big scientific breakthroughs have been done by individuals uh, not doing strategic mm -hmm. science, but uh, they're doing fundamental science of things that they're interested in. <laughs>
took an immense burden off my shoulders because if you're an academic you have to teach you have to do research basically it was a tremendous burden on on my wife and also I think on my kids uh, because um, to some extent I assumed they were going to be like me <laughs> and work really hard and uh, they would be um, but they chose careers which one wants to be a film, is a film director, another one in cartoonists, and they're very hard to make a living there. And uh, that's what they do, but it's, uh, it's tough, a tough area. Whereas I, to some extent, decided to um, do what I was told. I, I did what I was told. I can't, you might not believe this as a kid, and which was to work hard uh, as science first, and that's paid off for me. But uh, yeah. Um, uh, to some extent, uh, because I've got all this, I wasn't able to help my kids as, as much as I perhaps should. Um, uh, because I didn't think, I always thought everybody, that my kids would be like me. Thank you so much, Professor Croto, for your time here with us. And we wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. And hope to see you again in Vietnam soon. Okay, well, the, most likely on the internet. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. It's been a pleasure. And that's it for today's edition of Talk Vietnam. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and found the inspiration from what Professor Croto, Chemistry Nobel Laureate from 1996, has told us. Thank you and see you again next time. <laughs>